Good morning. Welcome to worship on this first Sunday in Lent, whether you are present here in our sanctuary or watching us and participating online. Not only do we say welcome, we want to be welcoming. So know that our desire is that you all feel warmly received, whomever you are, whatever your background, wherever you are on life's journey. We celebrate diversity and we are glad you are with us. Please remember to sign and pass the friendship pad that you have in your pew. And Chris has a special announcement to share. Good morning. Uh, first of all, there's an error in your bulletin. The doxology on the bottom of page three is actually the hymn uh, is number 759 not what's listed. It's a tune we all know, the words are a little bit different, but um, you'll catch on the tune, but I don't want you looking at 743 and going, wait, I read music better than that and this isn't it. Um, the other thing, as you know, today is what? <laughs> Thank you. So two o'clock today, come raise money for Music with a Mission, if nothing else, just come and spend some fun time with, your, with, your, um, uh, with members of the congregation, bring friends, bring family, have a good time. And last week, I know that I you know, asked this joke, and I said, why are mountains the funniest place to visit? And I told you that you would have to wait till this afternoon to find out. I know that was mean. That's fine, but we don't want to make a molehill out of it. Oh. <laughs> Speaking of after worship activities, next Sunday after worship, I will be sharing a brief presentation on the history and structure of the United Church of Christ. So if you have had questions or would just love a review or don't remember what you may have learned in confirmation, if you went to a UCC church during confirmation, come and, come and participate. It will not be super in-depth. It's going to be broad strokes and general kinds of history, and then I'll entertain some questions as well. Are there any other announcements to share today? Okay, then let us prepare to worship. Please rise in body or spirit and join me in the call to worship. We gather to worship God whom we love. We gather to worship God whom we need. We gather assured that God accompanies us into our wildernesses, into the shadowed places, into the unseen, deserted places. We gather. We gather assured that Christ guides us to new life, life in him. We gather assured that he will accompany us in this season of life. 
So let us journey to the cross and to the resurrection and empty tomb as new people through the Holy Spirit. Please remain standing and join in the opening hymn, which is printed in your bulletin.
You gotta have, you have to wash your hands before you eat. Yes, you do. You want to try one to forty days? Why? You want to be like Jesus. And how are we being like Jesus in forty days? Right. So for 40 days, Jesus was in the wilderness, and he fasted. Not eating was called fasting, and he prayed. And at the end of that 40 days, do you know what happened? They were what? They were just like 40 days. Right. They were just. At the end of the 40 days, the devil came to Jesus, and the devil tempted Jesus. So does anyone know what temptation is? What's temptation? <laughs> he, he, the devil tried to trick Jesus, right? Okay, temptation means trying to get somebody to do X instead of Y. That's exactly it. And X is maybe not a good thing, and Y is a good thing. Yeah. So sometimes sometimes um, the temptation is like you might like not have anything to do with it, so you don't know what it is. Right. Sometimes the temptation you don't know exactly what it is. Also representing you, the congregation, and reminding you of the promises that are made at baptism to help bring children up in faith. So, would 
Tyler Coburn, please come up. Not going to give it just yet. And Natalie Kyler. You can come and just stand right in front of Miss Denise and I, please, for a couple of minutes. All right. Also, Lily Nordsick is receiving a Bible, but she is not here today. So did you know, did you, did you guys know that when you were baptized, a congregation made special promises about you and to you? They did. They said that you're a member of God's family, and they promised to help you grow in learning about God and Jesus. They promised to have Sunday school for you, and they promised to love and support you and your whole family. So today, we are all following through on that promise by presenting you with a Bible. And inside of this Bible, there are maps, there are indexes, and all other, lots of other kind of helps for you to use. Your name is in it, along with the name of our church, so that you will always know who gave you this gift and that you will be reminded of our love for you. But most importantly, inside this book are 66 little books, 66 of them. In those little books are stories of faith, there are hymns, there are prayers, there's information about our history with God as, his, as God's people, accounts of famous people, and accounts of some not-so-famous people, people who had courage, people who had doubts, and there's also stories of the life-changing majesty of, God's, of God, the love of Jesus, and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And remember, these are not just ancient stories that don't have any meaning for us today. God is still speaking to us through them, to us. And the stories belong to all of us. They tell us who we are as God's people and that we belong together in God's name. So we hope that you will take time to read and explore God's Word. So, Tyler, we present your Bible to... Nope, stay here. We're not done yet. <laughs> and Natalie. May these words that are written on paper with ink also be written on our hearts and our minds. And may they be your guide for life, your comfort and your hope and in good times and in bad. Let us pray. O oh God, we rejoice with these children and their families in this step in their journey with you. Guide them as they use their Bible in Sunday school, during worship, and at home. And bless us all in the same way that we may continue to learn together and grow in our love for you and for each other. May your word truly be a lamp for our feet and a light to our path. We pray in the name of Jesus, your word made flesh. Amen. Now you may be seated, and congregation, let's sing together. Sunday school for the kids. give not out of guilt or obligation but because we know that God loves a cheerful giver and because this is a great way to declare our faith and our priorities as we support the church and others in Christ-like love.
O oh God, may these gifts represent our commitment to follow the way of the Spirit, the way of giving, the way of renouncing the world. We dedicate them and ourselves to serving you and others. Amen. You may be seated. concerns for a few folks that are listed. Uh, prayers continue for Claudia Hackney. Uh, Claudia had a cardiac procedure on Tuesday. You would never know. She's belting out alto in the choir this morning. And so glad it went well, sincerely. Uh, prayers for Teresa Huss and family. Um, not only upon the death of her father, Bill Sweeney, last week, um, but uh, Bill's wife, Darlene, has had her own health issues, so prayers for Darlene, and now Teresa has COVID again. Oh, no. So prayers for, for her and for all of their family. Uh, prayers for Bill Foy. Bill is uh, a friend of Vicki Keller, and he is undergoing chemo and radiation treatments, so prayers for Bill. Are there other concerns or joys to share this morning? Yes, right down here, Mark. Susan. Hi, uh, this is Susan Greenwood. I, I want to thank everyone for all of your support, all of your prayers um, as I journey through widow land and um, but I think I'm back and more routine now. Uh, our daughter has, is now back in New Mexico. Uh, I'm back from a 1,300 mile journey of following a U-Haul truck. So I, I am looking forward to new normal, but thank you very much for all your prayers and support. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing. Right down here, Dave. Hi, Pat Swindell. I think you should know that the 185 plus coats that were brought to this church were delivered Saturday into the city to Hope Academy, and they, the kids there are going to sort all the coats out, you know, sort them according to size and type, you know, adults and kids, tons of them, and they will use those as projects for the, the kids to distribute. We had hoped that New Life Ministries would do it, but they're on a, some kind of a postponed audit, and they aren't accepting anything right now. So um, Hope Academy is connected to New Life, and it's all going to work out in the end. And those coats are going to be hitting the backs of people any day now. So thank you so much. They were incredibly grateful for it and thought we outdid ourselves. So good job. Good. Thank you. And be sure to tell Jonathan thank you for spearheading the effort. Yeah, he enjoyed doing that. I'm sure, I'm sure. Pat Weichel here. I ask for prayers for my jazzercise instructor's daughter who was diagnosed with cancer right around Christmas time and was told she had about two months to live. She passed away two days ago. So prayers for the family. She was only 37. Thank you. Our sympathies. Anyone else? OK. Please take a moment to offer the silent prayers of your hearts and souls and spirits. 
and then I will close. Oh God, in this season of Lent, so many speak of giving up something. This morning I offer this prayer on behalf of these servants of yours in this same vein. Help us to not only give up doubts and fears, but let us give ourselves to hope and confidence. Let us not only give up gossip judgmental thoughts, comments about others, but let us give ourselves to words of understanding and encouragement, as well as to tangible acts of extravagant love and justice. Let us not only give up grudges, resentments, and hurts, but let us give ourselves to forgiveness, openness, and reconciliation. Let us not only give up busyness and frenzied living, but let us give ourselves to service and productive living with calmness, order, and peace. Let us not only give up pessimism, cynicism, and discouragement, but let us give ourselves to your promises, comfort, and encouragement. O oh God, when others speak of giving up things for less than in their desire to exercise sacrifice and self-denial, but also, may we recognize that it is ultimately through giving that we finally come to understand your supreme gift of Jesus to die on the cross. And may we give ourselves the opportunity for renewal and growth as we take on intentional times for reflection and an assessment of our spiritual life during this sacred season. Hear us also as we pray for Claudia Hackney, Darlene Sweeney, Teresa Huss, the family of Bill Sweeney, Bill Foy. We pray for the daughter of Pat's jazzercise instructor, for all their family, the daughter who died far too young at 37. We pray along with Susan, offering prayers of thanks for support and care extended. We pray for those with job stresses, personal problems, and with other needs that only you know. We pray for those in our nation who have been devastated by storms and the resulting damage and injuries and loss of life. And we thank you for relief efforts on their behalf. We pray for those, once again, affected by more gun violence in our nation for those affected by war and displacement in the Middle East and Ukraine. Give peace, we pray. And in the midst of these concerns, we also joyfully lift up those who are in the mindset of praise and celebration today and this week. We lift up again our third graders who receive Bibles today. Bless them and in their reading of your word. We thank you for the generosity of spirit and in tangible ways by donating coats, over 185 coats delivered to Hope Academy in Chicago. What a joy it is to share that news. Oh God, may all for whom we pray, feel you near. In the name of Jesus, our Redeemer, we continue now in prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Speaking of Bibles, I have a thing about reading directly from Thames. So if you're not in third grade and just received a Bible, and or if you have access to one of the red Bibles in the pews, please feel free to follow along with me. This first scripture is from the Old Testament, Psalm 25, verses 1 through 10, and it's on page 475. Everybody got it? Okay. This passage is almost like a prayer for Lent, that we receive the gift of God's grace, that we trust in that grace, and that we discern being led on God's path in our lives. This is Psalm 25, verses 1 through 10. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from, from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. Okay, the second reading is from the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, and that's on page 3 of the New, Ten New Testament in your pew Bibles. In this traditional gospel text, for the first Sunday in Lent, Jesus is tempted in the desert. Using his knowledge of God's word, he exemplifies how to face our desire to protect and serve ourselves, and instead trust that we belong to God and can seek spirit-inspired life and love. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, <clears throat> It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. Here ends the reading. So a French priest says that this actually happened to him. One late winter night, an armed robber confronted him on a side street in Paris, demanding his wallet. As the priest opened his coat to get his wallet from his back pocket, the would-be thief saw his clerical collar for the first time and immediately apologized. Father, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize you were a priest. Never mind. Well, the priest, of course, was relieved and good-naturedly offered the man a cigar, to which the robber replied, No, thank you, Father. I gave up smoking for Lent. <laughs> a 
Obviously, in more ways than one, the robber didn't get the message in whatever religious instruction he received. Some people give up something for Lent. Anne alluded to that during the children's time. Some of them more sacrificially than others. A teenage boy announced he was giving up his Nintendo Switch for Lent, to which his parents expressed surprise. And when they said something to him about it, he said, oh, that's no big deal. I'm just going to use my old Xbox. <laughs> the idea is to sacrifice something that you enjoy or, or to give up a worldly indulgence as a simple, practical way of trying to identify with the sacrifice of Christ, which is, of course, our focus during Lent. Now, this started out predominantly as a Roman Catholic practice, but the idea spread. And when done with proper motivation and in the right frame of mind, self-denial, giving something up, it can be a worthwhile practice, especially if it helps you turn toward God in a new and fresh way during this holy season. This, this giving up something, also known as renunciation, is based on the challenge of Jesus to his disciples to deny themselves and follow him. This self-denial was for the greater good, to focus on Christ's teaching, to focus on God's way. To renounce something is to reject it, it's to deny it. It's the opposite of announce. I don't know about you, but when I was confirmed in the catechism book that my father, who was the pastor, had us read, in that catechism book was the promise that said, I renounce the worship of self and of the world and give myself to God. It refers to the dichotomy between godly values and worldly values that Jesus talked about so often. This is the first of some fundamental trade-offs that we might focus on during Lent. Things of the spirit versus things of the world. You can't have this if you want that. You can't grow spiritually if you're focusing too much on worldly things. There's got to be a trade-off. This battle between spirit and, and world is the focus of our gospel lesson surrounding the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Satan offered Jesus food and power and protection during his 40-day experience, but Jesus chose the way of the spirit over the ways of the world. As Sharon read, it said, Matthew said that Jesus was led by the Spirit. In Mark, Mark's account of the temptations of Christ, it says that he was driven by the Spirit. Can you imagine being driven by the Spirit into wilderness? But in either case, we know that the Spirit was with Christ, and it was by the Spirit that Jesus was able to overcome. Now, don't get me wrong. Not all worldly things are bad. We were put on earth, after all, to enjoy life while serving God. But there's got to be some balance. Self-discipline is about creating and maintaining balance. And that's another theme of Lent, self-discipline. Doing our faith work. Taking time, maybe extra time than normal, for devotions, for prayers, reading your Bible, introspection, self-assessment, and so on. Too often we approach the discipline of our faith with the attitude of the man who, when told by his doctor that the best thing he could do was to give up drinking and smoking, asked, what's the next best thing? <laughs> How many times have we secretly wished for the next best thing? Okay, God, I know this is the best, what's the next best thing? It can be difficult to trade what's right for the sacrifices that might be involved. So we want what's mostly good for us, yet not too terribly inconvenient. It's the trade-off between, between doing what's right and between 
and taking the easier way. But having said this, no matter how tempting the easier way may seem, I hope that whatever lack of discipline or whatever failings we see in ourselves, there's also within us, either in a still small voice or a burning desire to find the right path and follow it, to serve God faithfully, a desire to know that we are not alone in our struggles or our doubts, or between the world and the Spirit, a desire to get a handle on God's will for our lives. But I know, I know, we make excuses. We may not follow through with our intentions. What's the old adage? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. We may not follow through, but, but still there's God, always there, ready to hold us up and pull us up and inspire us once again. There's God telling us it doesn't have to be this way. There's God ready to help us deal with our doubts. There's God tugging at our souls in a way that we cannot deny or dismiss. There's God urging us to make some trade-offs. And thankfully, there's God trying to give us a vision of what life can be like if we make Christ's priorities our priorities and not give in to the wilderness temptations, the temptations of the easy way. Or perhaps rather than being tempted to follow that easy path, instead perhaps we go the way of caution. We're cautious about what might happen when we might make that change in our life, even if we know in our heart of hearts that it's for the better. We're cautious when it comes to surrendering what may be needed to follow the way of the Spirit more closely. We're cautious. So we give up something for Lent, perhaps, that doesn't really de 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 require much sacrifice. Well, some of us are so cautious that we are like a porcupine in a balloon factory. <laughs> Seriously, when you go the way of caution in your life, you're likely to find what is ultimately a dead end. We were not given life to live cautiously. Yes, caution is certainly applicable at times, but we are called to live life fully and with passion as a God-given gift, not constantly looking over our shoulders. An anonymous author wrote some helpful statements for monitoring this caution in our personal relationships, perhaps motivating us to some, some good trade-offs. I quote, we don't want to be known as a blatant sinner, but we don't want to be known as a neighborhood saint either. So we go the way of caution. We want to be a respectable Christian, but we don't want it to be too noticeable and then be called holier than thou. So we go the way of caution. But friends, the way of Christ is almost always not the way of caution. It's tough to be a cautious follower. That's a, that's a lesson that the disciples ultimately learned. Took them a while, but ultimately they learned it. There have to be some trade-offs. You want to throw caution to the wind when it comes to your faith? You want to throw caution to the wind when it comes to the Spirit's calling in your life? Want to make some real trade-offs? Want to truly give up something for Lent? then try this. Don't just give up something, but also take on something more. In the past years in my ministry during Lent, I called this a Gus and Tom theology. Give up something, Gus. Take on more, Tom. Gus and Tom are friends for Lent. Okay? Try these ideas to start. Give up judging others but take on building others up in love. Give up dwelling on the past and take on being open to the future. Give up discontent and take on a sense of gratitude. 
Give up feelings of sorrow and take on the hope of the gospel. Give up being a discourager and take on the role of being an, an encourager. Give up the fear of death and take on the joy of life. Give up the need to be in control all the time and take on the prodding and the nudging and the guidance of the Spirit. Give up worry and pessimism and take on calmness and optimism. Give up thinking you can't and take on the phrase, absolutely, I can help with that. Give up anger and take on patience. Give up complaining, take on appreciation. Give up bitterness and take on forgiveness. Give up focusing on differences and give up or take on the attitude of unity. Give up trying to go it alone and take on and abide in the presence of Christ and the Spirit in you. You know, when you come right down to it, these trade-offs are not just for the Lenten season, but in considering them in light of our gospel example of Christ's denial of temptation, of not giving in to the easy ways of the world, this is certainly a good time for us to consider them. This Lenten season and thereafter, let's, let's make some trade-offs, but in a good way. Let's trade some caution for some honesty and enthusiasm for the Spirit. Let's trade our reluctance for passion for our faith and for our work and ministries of the church. Let's trade the tendency to stay in our comfort zone for the courage to step out in extravagant Christ-like love and service. Let's trade the ways of the world, the easy way, for the way of the Spirit, the sometimes difficult but soul-fulfilling way. Let's trade the way of self-inflation for self-denial. Let's trade lamenting, simply lamenting the problems of our nation and our world for the conviction to promote and advocate for peace and social and racial justice. Let's trade wastefulness and consumption for environmental justice. Let's trade our acceptance of the status quo for the desire to effect change for a better world. I'm not asking you to do much, am I? In the end, let's trade our blinders for the vision and the possibilities of God's realm on earth. Just like we pray in the Lord's Prayer, on earth as it is in heaven. Let's take on, trade off our blinders for the possibilities of God's realm on earth. Yes, let's do that. Let's do that. May it be so. Amen. Our closing hymn is found on page 211 in your New Century hymnal in front of you or near you. Please stand in spirit or physically as we sing together.
know, the path through Lent, the path through life, the path to the cross, and eventually, joyfully, to the empty tomb, is not always easy, especially when we confront deep questions and, and strive faithfully to walk in God's ways. So friends, be intentional about making some trade-offs, causing you to look forward and look toward God for strength and courage. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.